right. So I, I hope I can be heard. Yes. So welcome everybody to, I think the last talk today in this track. So I'm happy that so many people are here interested in a project. A couple of people um, work on for, I know, one and a half years or something. KCP. Um, it's complicated to understand. There are many views you will see, many views on this thing, which is called KCP. And everybody will find their own definition, their own use of that. And I will try to inspire you to think about how you can use it and how it's different to the tools we have had in the past, especially complementing Kubernetes as we know it. So um, about myself, I'm Stefan Schumanski. I'm working at Red Hat. I have been working long, long time, years on CRDs. So I was uh, implementer of many of the foundational features in CRDs. And CRDs are everywhere in KCP. So everything we, we see here, KCP, uh, CRDs are behind that. It all started with an experiment or with a, yeah, with a prototype. 2014, Kubernetes added namespaces to Kubernetes. Before that, everything was basically cluster scoped. Nowadays, everybody takes namespaces for granted. There was discussion around whether they need it, like whether the namespaces are necessary, and yes, the community concluded, yes, we want them, and they were added. And the isolation we get from namespaces is pretty weak. Everybody knows that. Like, you cannot run multi-tenant workloads with high isolation via namespaces. And namespaces are namespaces because they separate names. It was never meant for anything more than that. So the experiment we did was, what if we did a different kind of partitioning of Kubernetes? What if namespaces provided more isolation than just names? The most prominent example everybody knows, CRDs are not namespaced, right? So if we want namespace CRDs, we get something like a type space, bad name maybe, but not namespaces. So the experiment is, let's do more isolation than just names. If we do that, we get something we call it workspace. And the workspace is a type space in this sense that CRDs are independent, but basically everything else like discovery, open API, all that is independent. Even namespaces are independent. If you have two workspaces, you will have two default namespaces on both sides. So the result of that is basically a workspace is like a cluster. The user thinks it's a cluster, but it's backed by the same Kubernetes API server if, if you want. We put a target, so we, we built that like in one API server partitioning into workspaces so you can run it and you can have hundreds of workspaces. Every workspace is basically as cheap as a namespace. So as cheap and as quick, you can create new workspaces in milliseconds. And they don't cost because there's the same control plane behind it. We put another goal, and this is this one million. On one etcd, one API server, you cannot have a million namespaces. Everybody knows that. So we put another goal here, which is far beyond what you can have in one API server, just to drive our exploration. Obviously, we need something like many API servers, horizontally scaling. So that was a goal, the idea as a prototype. And the goal, of course, was clusters become uninteresting. Like you, 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 your cluster is your workspace. You don't think about that there are, there are other people on this cluster. If you are talking about namespaces, usually you're not admin in the cluster. So you think about there are other people on this cluster. But if you have a workspace where you can install CRDs and everything else, and you're admin, you forget that there is actually a cluster or an API server behind. All right, so if we do that and we did that, those questions come. I mean, if you talk to people about KCP, is this a better Kubernetes? Will we replace Kubernetes with that? And now we have KCP and it's so much better. Can I install operators in a namespace finally? And if KCP is its own project, the question comes, can we build that into Cube itself? Like, can we do something like namespace v2? And forget, forget about the questions for today. Those are basically not the questions we are asking. We try to um, step back 
So who have seen Turing machines in one way or another? In the studies of computer science or mathematics. So there are compute models. This is a physical Turing machine. It's a machine which can compute. It's very theoretical, but it can compute everything. Basically, you can compute in any programming language. And there's this, um, yeah, this band, this uh, thing with the characters, and it computes, it operates like a small CPU. And in computer science, you ask yourself, what can this thing compute? Can it compute the square function? Can it compute exponential functions? And it turns out this thing can compute everything. And then you ask yourself, for what is it really suitable? Which things you can compute on this thing in an elegant way? And let's get into this mood of thinking, we build a machine. You know one machine, which is Kubernetes API server. You can build controllers. KCP is built on, on, on Kubernetes, which means you can build controllers. But we, we will in, extend this thing. We don't stop at the workspace. We will add dimensions in a second. We build something, we call it for today, the KCP machine. And we ask ourselves, how can we use that? We are not building the better Kubernetes. If you look into the, uh, into the website of Kubernetes, it's saying basically it's a production grade container orchestrator. KCP, as, as a core project, is nothing, has nothing to do with containers, nothing to do um, with uh, orchestration of containers. So it uses the technology of Kubernetes, but we try to generalize it. So forget about containers for today, for the next hour. It's not about containers. For this talk, basically what you get are those workspaces. Here's one. It's pretty empty. There's nothing inside. There are CRDs. There are a couple of things like config maps, secrets, airbug, resource quota, all those generic things, but nothing about workloads, just not there. So it's a generic API server, and it has CRDs. All right, and oops, when we do that, we want to add three dimensions. So we'll talk about three extensions now. So we start with this empty API server, and we extend it. The first dimension I add, we have seen it already. It's a, the red arrow here, the red dimension, one million. We want many of those things. Every single workspace is like a small Kubernetes cluster, so you can write controllers against it. You have etcd behind, so you have all the resource version uh, semantics you know from Kubernetes. So basically, it's, it's Kubernetes at its core, but it doesn't have the workload APIs. The second dimension is, if I have a million workspaces, what are services between them? How can controller operate on one million workspaces? So we are, we are thinking, how can I program a controller which is basically multi-workspace aware? How can I do something like I get objects, everybody knows list and watch in Kubernetes, so you have informers, that's the programming model of Kubernetes. What is an informer against many workspaces, and how does an operator do something with many workspaces? That's the second dimension, and if you do that, if you think about that and find a solution, and I will show uh, how it looks like uh, later on, you can build multi-tenant services. Nothing you can really do in Kubernetes, at least not across a million or something like that. A third dimension is we at basically locality over the whole planet. So you have workspaces across the planet, basically in every region, for example, of the planet. Every workspace in itself, again, is like Kubernetes, has the guarantees of etcd for consistency. Across workspaces, you don't have that, especially you don't have that across regions. Across regions, you need a different model, and I put those um, blue boxes here at the bottom. Um, they are not consistent as, or in the sense of etcd. For example, they're eventually consistent. So if you need global state, you have to somehow get that in an eventual consistent way. All right, so we have three dimensions. Horizontal scaling, API service provide, uh, provider personas. This is this controllers which are against multi-workspaces. If you do that, you get the service provider persona into the system and planet scale, so it's really distributed over the planet. And the question is, again, think 
of a compute model. What can you build with such a construction? And that's a challenge for us today. So if we translate that, imagine you have one, one million generic workspaces, cheap and quick as namespaces. So in, in one millisecond, you can get another one spread over the planet. And if you do the math, 1,000 objects per workspace, you get a billion objects, something like that. And I have some examples here what you could build with that. Who has built end-to-end -end tests of controllers? I guess a couple of people here. So controller runtime, controller tools, there's something like an env test, right? It starts an API server and you can do your, your control loop testing. If you have such a thing which has space for one million, forget about an API server, just use such a thing and point your controller against one of the clusters, one of the workspaces, and do stuff until it's finished, and then delete the workspace again. Again, 100 milliseconds, you have a new one. Super cheap, super easy. That's one, one use case. If you have a million workspaces, you might think about how do they relate? One obvious thing is org hierarchies. So you could maybe model a company hierarchy in workspaces. So every workspace has one parent, and this means you get a tree, like this yellow company and the, the, the green company at the, at the bottom there. So you can build something like that, and we will see later on. So we have done that, and we have um, built a user experience about, around that in, uh, in KCP. It's not necessary, like it's an optional thing, but depending on the use case, this is very helpful. Clusters means they are isolated in a sense. They have their own airbox system. So they are their own role and role bindings, completely independent. And this means you can basically start as a cluster admin in every workspace, and it's independent from the permissions of the next one, of the, of the neighbor, basically. So you can start with a model where everybody is cluster admin again. They are much smaller than clusters, so sharing is not a problem if you have many of those workspaces, right? We share clusters in Kubernetes today because there's overhead. Like, to get a new cluster, it's expensive. And t just takes lots of time. If it's so fast and quick and cheap to get one, everybody can be cluster admin again. Multi-tenant operators, I talked about that. So service providers for those workspaces, it's an obvious example. CRDs are independent, so you can have different versions in different workspaces. Green is V1, V2, Alpha 1, and 1, V1, and V2 uh, we have here. So everybody can choose, basically, which CRD version uh, is desired. If you do that, you can also think, okay, multi-tenant operators, one can be 1.23, so an old version, and people stick to it, the yellow people. And there are those cutting-edge people, they want the newest version, and they can run in the same environment in parallel. So you can build such a setup and um, keep services running side by side. A generic control plane is super interesting if you don't talk about workloads. Crossplane is an example. Crossplane is a project which talks about non-workload objects. And this is a very good example, very good use case, how you can use a generic CAD-based API server. Crossplane doesn't need deployments. It doesn't need things about networking, about ingress. It's just um, unused by Crossplane. So use something like KCP and run Crossplane on it. And the overhead for Crossplane is much, much less than on Kubernetes because um, they can share infrastructure. Think about use cases where, yeah, in the IoT space, in the edge space, you have a million objects and they somehow need a consistent workspace, a consistent control plane. You could use that to connect your fridges to KCP, for example. And last but not least, here comes, I mean, Kubernetes comes back into the picture. If you have many clusters, you might think about use cases where you sync policies or where you sync actual workloads or you have the source of truth which operators should be installed. And as the last thing, I will uh, have another slide in a second. You might share APIs between the KCP on the left 
and clusters on the right side. And with that, you get something like API as a service based on CRDs. So if you want to understand more about the last use case, um, there's another talk tomorrow and uh, Birds of Feather um, on Friday about the idea to have basically services on the KCP side, which are multi-tenant just by the system, by definition, and to connect many, many tenant clusters, Kubernetes clusters to KCP, and you get a model which implements a software as a service based on Kubernetes CIDs. Super native, no REST API, which is non-standard, but with normal CIDs. And um, yeah, there are those two um, possibilities to hear about that. All right, so I showed some examples. I, I bet the audience here has many more. We start with a fresh Kubernetes without the workload APIs. Every cluster is generic and isolated and we add stuff. And the challenge for you is to think about what could you build with that by adding, by re-adding the things you want and to have many, many of those workspaces. All right, so um, zooming in a bit into um, API sharing. So I said a service provider can define APIs and can export them to many workspaces and build an operator operating then on the tenants. So here in this example, that's an actual API about that to, to get a bit more concrete. So we have an API resource schema. Imagine this looks like a CID. So everybody who knows CIDs, you have the names here, the kind, list kind, and so on. That's basically a CID spec, nothing else. You define that in the system in KCP. If you do that, nothing happens. It's not that KCP serves anything. It's just a definition of a resource schema. And then we have built something called an API export. So we can take those schemas, name them here in the, in the list, in the slice, create an export of that, and make your API resource schema as an API available, basically publish that to the KCP, to possibly one million workspaces. Everybody can bind to your export and use your controllers, basically, your semantic you define for your API. So up to a million API bindings can exist, and they point in some way, so we use a path here in this hierarchy in the, in the prototype, they point to the service provi provider, to your export, basically. And in the moment the user in his workspace creates this object, the, the API in this example, its third manager, is available in that workspace. Nothing is running in the workspace. You are the one on the right side who operates to op uh, who operates um, those objects. So you will see every object the user, like certificates in the, in the case of cert manager, every object the user creates, you will see in your controllers and you will do whatever is necessary to implement the semantics. And again, one to one million. That's the idea. All right. And this feels like software as a service, right? Software as a service, you have this persona, this one pers person basically who exports something and many, many consumers. And you come back to, I mean, if you do that, you have software as a service, at least in KCP. And this is from another talk, um, a rant I did uh, some time ago. Um, in Kubernetes, we have built something which doesn't support SaaS. This export thing doesn't exist in Kubernetes, right? You can have CRDs, you can have um, operators, but there's no way to get an API from somewhere into your Kubernetes. So we have built something like that. We have something like services. We have CRDs, custom types, but there's something missing. And this is basically the thing. And um, there's a CLI for that. Uh, we have built to bind an export to your uh, local workspace. All right, so um, one million workspaces, a billion objects, cheap and fast. Think about what you can do. Um, this is a website we have created to, to bring, or to, 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 to say basically what, what KCP is. And the main, the main points here I want to, to highlight. Maybe this is the most important slide for understanding. This is not about replacing Kubernetes. It's using Kubernetes at its core, like we use it, basically the complete API server minus the workload APIs is in KCP, it's used in KCP. Everything in a workspace, so this is a red rule set in stone, everything in a workspace is 
Kubernetes. So it's every API we offer is conformant to Kubernetes. Very important. Every workspace is like that. Tooling just works. If you use QCuttle, it just works in the workspace. And the APIs we build are just, just conformant. They are based on CRDs. You don't see CRDs, but in the background, CRDs are at work all the time. So we complement Kubernetes. This is most important here. And we live and breathe Kubernetes and the community. So we are all part of the community of Kubernetes. All right, so isolation through workspaces is a big thing. We have seen that. Um, can be many admins in every workspace, another ad admin, and um, many devices can be connected to that. So isolation through workspaces, we have seen up to a million. Massively multi-tenant API services, so you can build controllers operating on many tenants. Users can consume those services natively via a bind command, and there's nothing running in workspaces. You don't see how things are operated, but they are available, and the APIs just work as you, as you would expect. Think about this whole thing is horizontally scaled, and you have workspaces over the whole world, basically. You, in every region, you can have, you can have workspaces, but it's, form, it's forming basically a mesh. So it's one system, and you will see how the UX looks like in a second. Um, it's one system, one installation. Um, it's not like Kubernetes clusters, which are in this region, in this region, in this region, and you have to decide. It's, it's all in one system. Is this a walled garden? That's an important question. So we build bindings, right? We have exports and bindings. It's nice, it's in KCP, but what does it mean for my Kubernetes cluster? And there's a project we have also started to write multi-tenant operators in KCP and then use something like kubebind. Kubebind is an open source community project we have started in, it's available in GitHub, so you can search for that. And this brings back everything you build in KCP, large scale, like if you're a service provider and you have thousands of, of customers, you can use Kubernetes APIs built in those workspaces and bring them back to Kubernetes clusters. And kubebind is doing exactly that. So if you look here um, at the bottom, it's a little small maybe, you will find again a kubectl bind command. But again, well, here it's not against um, an API export in KCP, but it's against a HTTPS URL. And tomorrow there's a talk about that to see it in more detail how this works. So no world garden, KCP is a backend, is a system to build multi-tenant services. That's one view of, of KCP. So show me the code, what is KCP as code? Everything was theory now. So let's get this into more um, concrete context. So here's a repository, KCP, dev KCP on GitHub. And um, yeah, you can check that out, you can, you can run KCP. So let's, let's clone, clone that into the, to the local directory and it's all in one. If you start it with KCP start, it's, it's not like Kubernetes with um, different components. You can just say, say KCP start and it's running. If you do that, there's an admin kubeconfig being created in .kcp. If you set your kubeconfig variable, environment variable to that file, kubectl will work. It's Kubernetes. You are in a workspace. So two, two commands later, it's running and you are in, in, in the first workspace. So we built this command, ws, which stands for workspace. And it's an abbreviation. You could also write kubectl kcp workspace, but because this is very long and you type it often, we abbreviated that to just WS. And this operates more or less like CD, change dir in, in Unix. So you can say kubectl WS dot and it tells you you're in root. Root is the first workspace. There's nothing else in the system. It's pretty fresh, fresh etcd, just one workspace called root. And you can create another, another one. So I create one which is called KubeCon, and it's created. It takes, I don't know, 100 milliseconds to do that. It's ready, and we can enter it. So let's enter it. I said it's like CD, so let's say kubectl, WS, KubeCon, and we are in. In the background, your workspace is, set, uh, is put into the kubeconfig, so there's a different URL pointing to the new workspace, and you have a fresh Kubernetes-like cluster. It's empty, it's generic, but you can add everything you like via API bindings, for example, or any CRD you like. And remember, all keys was the example. 
what this is implementing is, is exactly that. We are now at this position in the hierarchy. So we started somewhere at the, at the top here and we moved one level down. That's our KubeCon workspace. And we are there. And we can go back like that. We are in a different workspace. And this is very much like every workspace is like a directory in Unix. Same idea. And again, this is just one way to see and use KCP. KCP is much more generic. You can, you can run KCP, at least we're working on that, without any hierarchy. But this is just one way to, to use it, and um, for many use cases, it's pretty nice to have that. All right, and every workspace, again, is like a Kubernetes cluster without APIs. Of course, you have to add APIs. We will see it in a second how this works. So you can see um, API resources, what is there, config maps, secrets, events, namespaces, resource quota, everything which is generic. Service accounts, Airbug, and so on. So this is what you get when you check it out and start KCP start. Um, you get a cluster with one workspace and you can create any, any number you like. So to sum up, KCP as a repository gives you that, gives you a generic control plane. So Kubernetes, based on Kubernetes, but we have removed disabled supports. It gives you workspaces, so isolation in one, in, basically in one shard. Um, it gives you a command to move around. It gives you export and bindings, and it adds sharding. We're working on sharding to run that, to run that in multi, multiple shards across the globe with eventual consistent global state. You can imagine why I'm talking about global state. One global state you see here on the slide, like the exports must, must be global, right? If you export something to everybody in this mesh of workspaces on the planet, you have to, to, to replicate your export everywhere. That's one example, we have more examples of that. But API export is one of those things. So you will serve everybody in this mesh of workspaces, and that's the fourth uh, point here, that's sharding. All right, so we have empty workspaces, and you can imagine what you can build on, uh, on top of that. We have some things, uh, some projects, some side projects, basically some services we are working on, and one is to re-add compute. So we have removed compute. Cool for many, uh, for many use cases, like if you talk about cross-plane, you don't want compute. But compute is kind of interesting, and uh, one topic we have tried, or what we are working on, is building something called transparent multi-cluster. So it's a compute service. It uses the APIs that Cube also provides, so deployments and services and similar things. So you can apply the usual APIs you know, but you get something like a, basically an elastic compute service based on Kubernetes APIs. The insight here is, I mean, this is just one service, very important. There can be many, many others. And what we have done here, and this is a pattern, I think, um, people like in this area. So we have re-added de deployments, we have re-added services, but we have not reused the scheduler of Kubernetes. So to build com uh, elastic compute, you want a different scheduler, obviously. So we run um, workloads not in KCP, we run them on real Kubernetes clusters, but we are hiding the clusters from the user. So you can add more and more clusters as capacity, basically, and the user's workloads, the deployments in the example here, will be scheduled onto those capacity clusters. So we have replaced something of Cube. So this thing, the, the construction we have built here in KCP, by removing things, gives us lots of flexibility to re-add them. Like we can re-add deployments, but do another kind of scheduling. If we take that to the next level, there are different, uh, different kinds of compute you can imagine. So many people might know vCluster, for example. Can you build vCluster on KCP? I bet you can. Again, you get all the sharing of workspaces. So it's an interesting topic maybe to talk about things like vCluster where you put KCP on top of one cluster of one OpenShift or one Kubernetes and reuse the compute below, but give everybody a workspace, but share infrastructure like API server. Another example, you want deployments, but you want to schedule to edge devices. Edge devices are, I mean, if you have many edge devices, like tens of thousands or millions even, you will not have a million nodes in a cluster, right? This doesn't work. So the schedule of Kubernetes, maybe it scales up to 5,000, but not to 20,000 or a million. 
So maybe for Edge, you want to do the same pattern, the same thing. You want to get back deployments and other kinds of yeah, workloads, basically workload-like uh, resources, but you want a specialized API for the scheduling, for the placement of workloads. So um, there are people in the community um, who think about that, and next week they, they start something like, I don't know, maybe it's a SIC which is coming up, we will see. But to talk about APIs, placement APIs, which reuse cube compute objects, but build another placement um, mechanism. And there are many more of those things. And this is a pattern that you can basically reconstruct, recompose things we know. And you're much more flexible than in Kubernetes. All right, this is a website, so take a look. Um, we love col collaboration. Everything here is open. So it's kcpdev slash kcp on GitHub. Um, it's an open source project, community driven. Um, we have weekly meetings on Tuesdays, uh, 5 p.m. European time, so uh, six hours uh, before, what is it, 11 or something. Um, we have a YouTube channel if you want to watch um, discussions, old community meetings, it's all there. Um, we have a Google group, so if you want to, if you prefer emails, that's fine. And um, the most important thing, we have a Slack channel, so we are always there basically doing work hours, so there's always somebody. If you want to talk to us, explore um, KCP, or even help us contribute, that channel is uh, the main place for communication. All right, that's all I wanted to show, and I think we hopefully have some time for questions. Um, before we start questions, um, we have t-shirts here in the front, if somebody's interested in t-shirts, um, Andy is here, Andy is co-leading um, KCP. Um, he distributes the, the, the t-shirts, I think. So come here and, yeah. All right, so time for questions. Great presentation, thanks, Stefan. Um, two questions. Uh, is there any relation to uh, hierarchical namespaces? Uh, with KCP? No, technically not. Um, namespaces, so we are also asked, and this is a similar question, can we just do namespaces v2? I mentioned that, right? <laughs> this is something right. similar. And namespaces v1, they're an API, and it, it is limited as it is, right? Sure. So we cannot change anything. Um, workspaces have a hierarchy if you use this model. With this model, you get a hierarchy, but the namespaces inside are flat again because they're a namespace v1. Um, the pattern you see, people don't care about namespaces anymore. They just stay in default and that's it. So, I mean, would it be possible or thinkable to have the workspace be a core concept in Kubernetes API? Um, yeah, it's feasible, <laughs> certainly. The API server we are using, it's a Kube API server with modifications. It adds partitioning of the key space and yes, technically this is feasible. Um, it's not done at the moment. So we add, we use Kube API server and API extension API server and we add exactly that. You touched on the idea of syncing at global scale in an eventually consistent manner. What's the mechanism for that? What would you be using to have them talk to one another? Um, at the moment, we are just exploring something pretty simple. It's a distributed cache. So the objects we know we want to share, we want to replicate. Every shard will push them into a cache which is globally replicated. And the most interesting bit here is the question, what is a compute model in such a world? Like how does a controller work on eventually consistent secondary data? So the model we came up with, which we are implementing is basically a, co a controller which is aware of that, right? It's a different model, a little different from Kubernetes, extended basically. It has a local informer, so it has a local um, memory cache from the local shard. So it sees everything, every workspace local. And if it doesn't find something there, it has a second informer which is um, fed by this distributed cache. That's a compute model we came up with. Um, this works very fine with those things like API exports or in, in compute we have sync targets, for example, things which are pretty static in a sense. Um, 
I would eventually consist in there. No, nothing stops us from adding APIs, for example, for consensus. So we, if, I mean, sometimes you want that, right? You need consensus, which is somehow global. And there could be an API which is based on a different mechanism, not this um, distributed cache, but something else which gives you consensus. Those things can be built in. They can be even primitives. Um, it's not, I mean, it's, it's an open domain, basically, what we need and what we build there. Uh, thank you, Stefan, for the presentation. You mentioned earlier like, that the target is to be able to create a workspace and make it as cheap as namespaces. Can you tell us more on how workspaces are implemented? Like, is there yep. a dedicated API server it's pro process, a dedicated ETCD? How does it work? Inside? So um, we add something. I mean, you know it how containers work in, in the Linux kernel, right? Um, there's some kind of context, and there's a namespace name passed around in the Linux kernel. We have basically the same model here. So we pass around in the context something we call a logical cluster. It's part of the API server URL the, the client talks to, so we derive it from the URL from the path and pass it around. And in the storage layer of Kubernetes, we turn that into a different prefix in etcd. So that's a technical trick to do that. And um, there are some, some things, I don't go into details here, but um, you want efficient lists cross tenants, but on the same resource. So you have to put the logical cluster name at the right position in the key. And we can talk about that in detail, but that's the idea. So that's why it's efficient. That's why you can have informers cross workspaces. Uh, thanks, Stefan. Great talk. Uh, I have tons of questions, but I'll limit it to one for now. Uh, you mentioned that with KCP, you envision like developers having a single API where they can still deploy things like kubectl applied hf deployment or yaml, mm -hmm. but the actual workload runs on one of the underlying workspace clusters. Yeah, in this model of transparent multi-cluster, it's one service. I stress that. It's one service built on top. It's not necessarily the compute service. You can have many other variants. That one works in a way that every Kubernetes cluster, which is capacity for the service, has a synker agent which connects to KCP. It watches its tenants, so it watches deployments, and it pulls them down. And um, there's some transformation happening to make them work on the Kubernetes, and then they're executed in Kubernetes. And the status is synced back. So in the, in the workspace, you see deployment dot status, whatever you are used to in deployments. I see. Okay, so it's syncing all the status back to the KCP server for that deployment. That's a model of the service, yeah. I see. Got yeah. it. Thank you. We're a little bit out of time. Is it okay if we keep going? Because there's more questions. Uh, thanks for the great talk. Uh, are there already client libraries or documentation or guidance on how to write a multi-workspace controller? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so Andy is an expert here. If you want to come after the talk, um, he knows all about that. Um, we have an extension of controller runtime clients, and we have a generator which is similar to Client Go, which adds scoping to informers and everything. So you can, you can watch everything on a chart, but you can also scope it down to one workspace. So it's very Client Go-like. Uh, I think it's even derived from that. I'm not sure. But um, Andy is expert, so client libraries. Thanks a lot. Good question. We're going to do one more. So yeah, one thing that is not clear to me is, isn't KCP subject to all the scalability limits of Kubernetes? So when it comes to etcd, as far as number of objects you store, or you know the way eventual consensus here our replication works, isn't KCP subject to all the scalability limits of etcd the same way you mentioned no, um, scheduler? Etcd it? is, um, I mean, if you scale out, we have multiple etcds. We even researched, it's not really ready and we don't use it at the moment, we researched to use something like Cockroach at the basis to scale even more. But the point is, and this is, it's an intentional decision, workspaces are smallish clusters, so they're usually not the size of a 5,000 node Kubernetes cluster. 
So, um, of course, for one workspace, you have the scale limit of etcd, obviously, because this always lives on one etcd, or um, the whole APM machinery limits what you can do in one workspace. But because workspaces are this consistency domain, so the resource versions only make sense with, within one workspace, um, you can scale them up, them up. Like, you can have many, many workspaces or many, many shards, and every controller really cares about one partition of that. That's the way how we get much higher scale. I see. So you're focusing only on a subset of objects like workspaces, and through the export APIs, you're selectively exporting them to other clusters, and that way you're managing scale. So the objects always live in one workspace, and the workspace has, it must fit into one etcd. That's, that's the limit. The export is cross workspace. That's completely independent. But the objects live in one workspace. Thank you so much. All right, thank you.